every time I fail, I make sure that I that I learn from that. I guess my long-term goal is to own a billion dollars in real estate. People have been saying, you know, the bubble's going to burst. I don't think personally that it will, not in my lifetime. I asked one day at uh, one of our weekly committee meetings, I said, you know, is anybody else not enjoying this? And I said, because I'm not. I said, well, why don't we just stop doing it? So Welcome to X3 Podcast, your destination for business, people, and sports. And today we have a, such an amazing episode. It's right in front of you. But before you watch this episode, you go to the Canadian Dream uh, Podcast and take a look at this guest was in that podcast. That's what I, I learned from him. And I said, man, I need to interview this guy. No, and we have so many things in common, and we, this guy, is, it is a great guy, but also a savage in business, and it's going to be a pleasure for me who really like that subject to interview. But before we start it, please go in our channels, our social medias, and subscribe, and don't forget, as you watch in this video, you make your comments and your questions so we can interact. And let's get started with William Donnellan. Man, thank you very much for coming. Right, so it was a, man. I was very excited to interview you. Very excited. You no, know, we got the same haircut. We have the, <laughs> <laughs> we have the same taste for haircut. We have three boys. That you have three boys. You know, you have multiple business. I have multiple business, but you are ahead of me because we've been successful in different industries, and I'm just starting putting my foot out of my industry right now. And that's where it took my attention. And we are pretty much the same age. And and we came to Vancouver at the same time, you know, and we start to work pretty much the same area. So I have many things in common, but the show is not about me today. It's about you. William, introduce yourself to our our audience out there who wanna knows about who is William Donovan. First off, thank you for having me here. It's it's a pleasure to be on your show. Um my name is William Donlan. I'm the owner of IRL Group, a group that focuses on uh, construction, uh, hospitality, and real estate. Um, like yourself, I moved to Canada in 2009, same year. Um, I came here on my way to Toronto uh, for a month, came to Vancouver for a month, and I never got to Toronto. I've uh, been here since. <laughs> um, came with my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, and now we have our, our own three little uh, Canadians like yourself, and uh, we absolutely love Vancouver and BC, and this is our home. Well, I'll, I'll, the name of our podcast is X3 because X for destination, and three, we are based in three pillars business, sport, and people. And your company also looks like it's, it's based on three pillars as well. Can you explain why the IRL? Yes. So, IRL, people always ask me, what does IRL stand for? Is it Ireland? In, is it in real life? Is it Ireland? Um, uh, and I, I tell them it stands for, it's really Laura's. Laura's my wife's name. Oh, okay. uh, but but uh, it, the name is an abbreviation for Ireland. Um, but when we got married in 2014, my sister had a little uh, slideshow going at the hotel reception. And... Uh, at the end, she put up IRL, it's really Laura's. And everybody got a good laugh out of that, but that's the truth, really. Um, <laughs> that's uh, the, it's really Laura. Yeah, Laura is um, my wife, as I said, and uh, my life partner, my business partner, and the mother of our kids. And uh, I believe behind every successful person is an even more successful person. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's no doubt I couldn't have done uh, any of this without her, so... Yeah, and I'm going to tell something. If, as I said to you, uh, if you were at home and if you ever pretend to go to the Canadian Dream podcast and watch the podcast there, he talks a lot about his wife, you know, and I noticed uh, that. I, I, I don't, the only thing I know about your wife is her name and what you said in that podcast. But in base in everything you said, I have no doubt it's a very strong woman. And, and definitely, man, if you have opportunity, we'd like to have her on the X3 podcast as well, right? That'd be because great. Because you take care of the companies and she has well, but she's take care of herself. She's take care of the kids, you know, and she managed to do that very well. And uh, definitely we want to want to hear from her how she managed that, right? Because, man, I poor my wife because <laughs> she has, we have three kids, I have myself, you know, and we are busy. 
man, to is not an easy job. You know? No, it's Our not. Our wife doesn't have a easy job, man. That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, it's hard to juggle everything, you know. Um, you know yourself what kids um, are like and they take up a lot of your time and you got to spend as much time as possible with them and you also have to spend as much time as you can with your business. You know, you can't be an absentee owner. Uh, yeah. I believe you got to be hands-on. Um, you got to be available. Uh, but you got to find that right balance as well. Yeah. But he's the family. For the women, when I look to my wife, right, and uh, it's really hard for for, her, for them, at least my wife, she's very concerned about her look, you know, and she's a mom of three kids, busy. And we also, we, we care of about our look, but not that much, you know. We, we first, we think about, at least me, I'm thinking about my business, what I go do my day, you know, what I'm going to dress, the last thing I'm going to think. And I I pretty much grabbed it something more neutral color base I can put it on and go off but my wife no no they're really concerned about how they're gonna look and everything and that's a part of the women and they care that also on top of everything we do and they do the same and even more they carry that as well I don't know if that society put it out you know on on the women's but I I see how she try to work around that Oh, and you have to appreciate how much work our women have, you know. And yeah, uh, yeah, just because I love my wife and watch everything she does for our family, I believe, not believe. It's clear you do the same for Laura. So, Laura, I want you to end the show, okay? So, this is an invitation. Let me know when you have time. Tell Will to get the kids. I'm very, very, like, look like we're close friends, like Will. Get Will. <laughs> get William to <laughs> take care of the kids and come to the XP podcast. William. Let's get you started, man. I want to know about your childhood. How, how everything started? Because a guy like you, successful, busy, orientated, you know, and with that mindset, does it come out of the blue? Yeah. Um, I was at a conference recently, and somebody uh, asked the question: entrepreneurship. You know, are you born with that, or is it something that you can create? And uh, the uh, host said you're most definitely born with that. So it takes a certain individual to become an entrepreneur. And I think uh, you will agree with me when I say that. Um, as a as a kid, I was, I had lots of energy. Um, you could say I was wild. Uh, I loved to play sports. Um, I captained many sports teams. So I was, I guess, a leader from a young age. You're I raised in Dublin? Uh, in Galway. Galway, the west okay. coast, west coast of Ireland. And I grew up in a small village with about 2,000 people. Okay, uh, very small. Yes. The closest uh, city would be about 10 miles away. It'd be about 200,000 people there in Galway. Um, a beautiful place. And uh, we kind of grew up, I guess, uh, on a farm with a farming background in the country. Okay. Uh, my dad was used to harvest crops for a living. Um, so from a young age, we would be driving the tractors and uh, helping out. Um, we worked... Uh, in the construction industry as well with my uncles uh, we build homes and uh, garages and all that kind of stuff just small time construction so you can tell you can tell based on what you're saying right now where we decide to interrupt you just you can tell in early age you, you work about hard work there yes we did we learned yeah we learned about hard work at a, at a very early age and I remember when I came to Canada in 2009 and somebody uh, told me that you were going to get so paid so many dollars per hour. I couldn't believe that. I said, "This is great. I'm going to get paid for every hour I work. <laughs> like this is this is going to be a dream come true." Um, because uh, in the world that I grew up in, uh, you could work all day long, and when I say all day long, I mean twelve, fourteen, sixteen hours, and whatever you got at the end of the day, you got, and yeah. you didn't complain. You were grateful for that. Uh, so we worked hard from a young age. Yes, um, came from a big family. My parents had ten kids. So uh, uh, we grew up in a, in a big family. We're all very, very close and, and still are. Um, and I never thought for a minute that I'd leave or that I'd leave Ireland and live outside of Ireland uh, for a long period of time. I was ne wasn't even interested in traveling. But uh, Laura said in about 2008, when the crash came in in Europe and in Ireland uh, and the construction industry really, really slowed down. You were working in construction at yeah, that time. Yeah, almost stopped. And she said, how about we go and, and do a little bit of traveling? So I was kind of saying, well, this is our opportunity to do it. Might not never get the chance again. 
so we decided to go uh, to Canada for uh, a year on a working holiday visa. Uh, and we decided to go to Vancouver for a month on our way to Toronto. And as I said, we, we never got to Toronto. So came to Vancouver and just fell in love with the place. Um, I uh, am a carpenter by trade. So uh, I love working with my hands. Um, my mum's side of the family were in the hospitality industry. So that's where that came from. My dad's side in the construction. My mum's side also in the construction as well. Um, so uh, that's, I guess, how we, I think I got bitten by both bugs. And that's how <laughs> I ended up in the hospitality and construction and, and real estate. But when you left Ireland, you, you didn't have your, 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 your business, right? You worked for somebody else. Is that correct? That, that um no, I set up my first business in Ireland at the age of 19. And okay. I had a lease on a pub for five years. Oh, you saw your pub back yeah, home? Yeah, I had a pub back home as okay. well. Okay. Uh, myself, I had a lease on a pub. And then I also had a construction company. But was which... for the love of the business or love of the beer? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> a bit of both. Uh, but when the lease was up in the pub, uh, and I didn't have that commitment anymore, I... Uh, and we decided to travel for a short period of time. Um, I shelved the construction company, so basically froze it and left it there and said, you know, I'll, I'll pick up the reins again when, when we get back. But uh, we never got back. Man, and how, so to that point in your life, well, you know, just 18, right, 19. So you open your business, your two business, and you're doing well. You've not failed. Everything was doing doing great on your business side and then decide to come to Canada. Yes. Well, the the work or the pipeline dried up, you know, the construction industry basically stopped in 2000, yeah. the end of 2008. Yeah. We were working for a, a developer who was building hundreds of homes, like I'd say about 300 homes. And we were selling them off the plan. So before they were built, pre-sales, they were sold. So, and then things started to slow down in 2008. So the writing was on the wall. And next thing, we had about 50 homes built and they weren't sold. And that had never happened before. So we could see the change in the pattern. And at uh, Christmas time in 2008, that developer said, I'm not going to, to build any more homes and we're going to lock up the gate and, and we're going to, you know, close the site. That's what the, the point to... Yeah. So uh, the site never opened up again. It did close and that, that was it. Them homes, them remaining homes that were to be built were never built. And also you, William, like if you talk about your family, you know, many siblings, it looked like we grew up in a very tight and close family to leave because I, I went through the same thing. To leave your country, to try out something that's so far away. It's not about like, oh, I'm missing home. Two hours fly, I'm home. It's not about that. How was that for you? Yeah, that was a very tough. Like, that was most definitely the toughest part. Um, as I said, a big family, very all very close, and everybody living at home. And we were going to Vancouver, a city that we we didn't intend to stay in, and we didn't have any contact info for anybody. We was we weren't going to somebody that was going to help us out or steer us in the right direction or put a roof over our head. Uh, we arrived in Vancouver, uh, not even having a phone number for. Uh, somebody to to reach out to so um a new city a new beginning um and as i said a month you know turned into three months and six months and a year and then 15 years later here we are but i think the people being the canadians being so kind yeah uh just such amazing people um made it that much easier but it was still tough rodrigo um I remember every time we went home for the first probably three or four years, it was always very hard to leave Ireland again and come back to Vancouver. And you were always wondering, am I doing the right thing? And uh, a lot of people would ask you, you know, like your mom, uh, my mom and Laura's mom and, and, and our family, you know, why don't you just stay in Ireland? You know, but we knew that there was opportunity in Vancouver and in Canada and uh, we weren't ready to come home yet. You, you just made me remind my mom. Um, she never understood why I want to stay here so bad. And just, I have to go through the, the immigration process, everything. And, you know, I, I, I mean, the, my determination to stay was so big. And she questioned me, why? Why Why don't talk about another place? We you live in the U.S. You went to Canada now. You, 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 you want to live there so bad. And then tried to explain to her, she never understood it. To the moment, to the day she came to visit me for the first time, William. And I'm yeah. never going to forget that because 
I forgot about that. We have that conversation back in Brazil. And one day she was here. The first time she came, one day she stopped and said, son, now I understand why you, you want to leave here so bad. You know? uh, yeah, that's so interesting because I had the exact same experience with my mom. Really? Uh, my mom and dad. After about three years, my mom said to my dad, who is... Uh, very traditional Irish, uh, never drank, never smoked. So I suppose that's not too uh, <laughs> typical, but uh, just a really, really, really hard worker. The hardest person, uh, the hardest worker I've, I've ever met and a great role model for us all. And uh, he had no passport. So after three years, my mum said, we better go and visit uh, Laura and William because it looks like they're going to stay there. We got to go and see their new home and see what it's like. And, and uh, every Every weekend before that, I would call my mom and she would always ask, when will you come home or will you come home? But when she came to visit after three years and they saw Vancouver and how beautiful it was, they, she didn't ask again. She never, and when I talked to her at the weekend after that, she wouldn't ask me at the end of the call, you know, will you come home? She knew that we were in a good place and we had a good uh, support uh, network around us and that we were happy here. So she was happy for us and she knew it was a safe place. I think uh, having uh, grown up in a small village in the west of Ireland and knowing that your kids are in this big city, you know, in North America was probably a bit overwhelming. And she thought that it wasn't safe. But when she came here and, and realized that Vancouver is a beautiful place, it is safe and there's great opportunity there. and We were happy there. She was she was happy for us. Wait, and do you have do you think a, a, a guy like you, like us, right? Immigrants come from far away, right? Come to this place, this beautiful place with great people. Do you think that to leave our family behind, to leave everything we love and you know, there was raised and you know, everything behind and come to Canada, especially Canada, as you mentioned, is a great country. That's put us in a some kind of advantage. When you compare for the Canadian who was born and raised in Canada, do you think we have to live this different world? Do you think? Uh, I think um, being here as uh, an Irishman um, definitely was an advantage for me because uh, I'll just use a simple example. If I was to open up, you know, multiple Irish pubs in Ireland, they wouldn't be unique. You know, there's a lot. Every pub in Ireland is an Irish pub. But the fact that we were in Vancouver and we had experience running Irish pubs in Ireland and now we had the opportunity to do it in Vancouver, which no one had ever done before, that this was a very unique selling point and this could be a huge hit. I remember when we came here, Rodrigo, uh, the Irish pubs, some of them were pulling pints of Guinness in one go. They didn't realize it was a two-stage process. Uh, other Irish bars were wearing kilts. Uh, they mustn't have realized that we don't wear kilts in Irish pubs in Ireland, you know. So just different little things like that. And I had no intention of opening a pub here. Uh, really? No when intention. you first came, like it was towards construction? It was construction. I love construction. I'm, I, I'm, you know, as I said, I love working my, with my hands. I'm a carpenter by trade. Uh, I didn't have any interest in going into the pub business or the hospitality uh, industry. Um, we done that in Ireland. It was a lot of hard work to do both. And uh, I had promised Laura we wouldn't do that again. And in 2016, uh, I just couldn't get rid of the itch. And uh, I started viewing places for rent. And uh, <laughs> without uh, talking to Laura. Yeah, yeah. Without <laughs> talking to Laura, yes. And uh, then I found this uh, great location. 1082 Granville Street. That was uh, the first pub, pub. That was the first one in 2016. And it used to be the stone, the stone Temple, which was very famous here. And then Joseph Richards took it over and I bought the license of, of Joseph Richards. And I looked at it and I said, this place has potential. And it was an interesting story because I was looking at another venue and the realtor said, I have this other place, but it's not been listed yet, but I do have a key. So he said, come, take a look. come and take a look. And I looked at it and I said, there's a lot of potential here. It needs a lot of work, but... This is a good location. Most of the work, this can you have to space. do it? Yes, we could do the work ourselves. So that was a huge advantage. Yeah. And um, uh, I asked Laura, I went home that night and I told Laura and she was like, no way. And I said, just please go tomorrow uh, and I'll set up an appointment and go and have a look at it and let me know what you think. And she went and looked at it and she called me the next day. I remember I was out on site pouring concrete and I was like, I seen her number come up and I said, oh, this, 
this won't be good. And uh, I answered and uh, she was laughing at the other end and she said, like, that place has potential and, and I really like it. And then we decided to, realized. yeah, we decided to go for it and it took us about 18 months to build it out, which was a huge, uh, a huge task um, to undertake and a huge expense. Um, you know, our budget probably trebled uh, and that was a lot of stress and anxiety at the time. But thankfully, when we opened our doors, uh, everybody was excited about it and, and it just took off and it done really well. Yeah, like a, if not from Vancouver, like a, the place, his pub, his first pub, you have four now or five? We have five now, yeah. Five, yeah. Now, right? The first pub is a very busy location, very great area for bars and restaurants. And yeah, it's a hot spot there, man. Yeah, the Granville Entertainment District. So there's lots of action yeah. down around there. Um, and I think, I'm hoping, you know, in the next couple of years, now when the World Cup comes to Vancouver, we'll have lots of more action. Man, you're going to be in the right spot. Yeah. If the right business. <laughs> we have. We have two of our locations. We prepare yourself for that. We start and prepare yourself for that. Yeah, because two of our locations are less than 10 minutes walk from the stadium. So Donlan's on Granville Street and Smith's in Gastown. So they're both very close to the stadium. And I think they will both do really well. Uh, during the World Cup, and I'm looking forward to that. When you're talking about business, that's the, a lot of people, because we, we see many people on social media talking about business, right? But they, they talk about the the fashion side of the business. They don't talk with the details inside of the, the business mind, how the things work. And that's an example of that. You know, he, 2026, and two years from now, the World Cup is coming, and he started to prepare himself. You know, and that's how it takes. That's sometimes... Uh, of course, that's is an easy prediction, right? But having many things we do in our daily basis, they are not that easy to predict. And sometimes you fail, but sometimes you hit on. And that's an example of that. So two years before the World Cup, you know, he's getting ready for the World Cup. Yeah, I, I truly believe that most projects fail because um, of the lack of planning. And uh, planning, I think, is the most important part of any project. And you have to put the work in on the front end. Uh, if you don't, um, you you will fail. And what is your biggest failures in business so far? Because we're talking a lot about success, right? But man, we are basing on, on our failures, um, right? Yeah. And I had lots of failures. And, <laughs> and, and I continue to fail. Yeah. But, uh, you know, every time I fail, I make sure that I that I learn from that. And I try never to do that again. But uh, one that always comes to mind is uh, uh, a restaurant, a takeaway we opened up uh, downtown in Vancouver. Restaurant. And, yeah, it cost us a lot of money and it just it just never took off. Um, I think there was a number of things we didn't get right and uh, we weren't enjoying it. So thankfully, we were able to um, sublease the space and get out of that uh, probably after about a year. But it was hard work. Um, and it was disappointing, but you know, you can't change the past. So we just moved on. Um, we got out and we got somebody to take over the space and, um, we moved on to the next, the next project. But, William, it can be a silly question, uh, but you have a pub, like you serve food in a pub, right? It's not yes. like a complex, but, but the restaurant is not kind of similar or not. The they operation are, is different. They are similar. They are similar, but uh, our locations are uh, okay. more focused on, I guess, um, beer, you know, burgers and fries, fish and chips, wine. Um, the location where you open the restaurant. Uh, yes, all okay. of our all, all of our current models are are that focus, um, but the one that didn't work was uh, a restaurant, so it was more focused on food. Oh, yeah, it was more, more food focused. Um, and uh, we did try and pivot a bit um, and turn it into like a bar and kitchen, but uh, it just wasn't working. And, you know, we weren't enjoying it, as I said. So we decided to stop doing it and, and to move on. Never come back to restaurant business? You know, I think we will. I think sometime we'll open up a restaurant, maybe a high end restaurant. I think at some point we might do that. Um, I won't, I'll never say never, but. Um, not in the near future. Okay. Yeah. What's your plans? Where do you, you aim for the uh, near future, next two years, beside the World Cup, get ready for that? But Yeah, I suppose the new and exciting 
um, ventures we have coming, uh, we just set up a development company called Vanway Properties. And um, we're very excited about that because uh, one of our biggest goals or dreams uh, or aspirations has always been to build uh, boutique homes. Um, and we're, it took us a, a long time to put the foundation in, but now we have a very solid foundation and a great team in place. Um, we have the best people in the industry, hands down. Uh, they're loyal, they're honest, uh, they're hardworking. And uh, with that team and with uh, the proper planning and uh, I think the demand that's there for what we call the missing middle in Vancouver, because that's what we're going to focus on. So basically you take your standard Vancouver lot, 33 foot by 122 foot, about 4,000 square feet, and uh, turn that into multiple units. So you can take a single family home and turn it into two, four, six, eight units, depending on the area and what you decide will work best on that lot and uh, create more homes and uh, more affordable homes um, for people in Vancouver. And that's that's always been a dream of ours. And I'm very excited to say that we have set up the company and we're uh, we actually just closed yesterday on a piece of land and uh, we're ready. So to you're start. starting. Our yes, we're starting and we're going to we're hoping to have our design and our permits in by the end of the year and then to start building early next year. And I'm not from that field, but that's as uh, I'm living in Vancouver, right? So we hear about the market, we leave the market, right? And for you, for not Vancouver, and one of the craziest like a real estate market in the world, right? Is as we are talking on before we start the show about how much since we arrived here for the first time, we hear about the the the, the market will crash, the market will crash because how crazy the thing goes, but does it stop growing? Yes, that's right. Um, and these they, they keep getting more expensive and more constructions. Yeah. It's crazy. Since we came here, people have been saying, you know, the bubble is gonna burst. Uh I don't think personally that it will, not in my lifetime. Maybe I'm a bit bullish towards the industry, but um I think it's a supply and demand issue. If you take Vancouver uh, and take uh, where we are right now, downtown, and maybe go out 25 kilometers to Coquitlam, and draw a big circle. And you can envision that about 30% of that area is mountains. You can't build. About 30% is sea. You can't build on that either. Not yet, anyway. Uh, so there's very little land. And when you take away all of the... Uh, infrastructure and you know the schools and the hospitals and and all of those kind of things the roads the parking lots um there's not there's probably less than 20 percent available for development so it's supply and demand the price will always go up because there's not much land available that's what i think and people want to live in vancouver look at what happened to us you came here uh for a short time as well, same as ourselves. And here we are 15 years later yeah. in Vancouver. And how many more people do we know that that happened to? It's, you know, I guess we, we are creating this problem ourselves because Vancouver is just so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, it's clean, you know, it's safe. People want to live here. So uh, I think there's 50,000 people moving here every year. Um, uh, that's what I hear. And I'd say we're building about 15,000 homes a year if even. So uh, we have to catch up. Okay, Williams, if 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 you have to bet your whole money you have today, then you have these three areas. You have the the construction, right? The real estate and construction. And you have your your pub, you know, and you have a restaurant. You said one day, you know, which one do you put in all your stakes for the next 10 years? Um, that's a hard question. A, that is a hard question because all my money. <laughs> that's a hard question because um, a lot of people ask me, uh, you know, which do you prefer the most? And I honestly tell them I don't have uh, a preference. I don't love the construction more than the hospitality, you know, or the real estate. I have a passion for them all. I believe, you know, life is short and. If you want to be successful in your industry, you have to love it. You have to be obsessed with it. You have to give it 110% or else it won't be successful um, unless you have a lot of luck. So I love them all. But if I had to say, okay, this one I think will be most successful, I think I'd have to go with uh, 
the construction and real estate over the hospitality, just because hospitality, um, the margins are very slim and uh, labor is going up all the time, as it is with the construction, but uh, it's very tough to get people and it's uh, produce, you know, your cost of goods is is going up and up and up all the time and, and some things are just hard to believe uh, the prices uh, of some items right now but um, I think the construction would be a safer bet that's what I think to make money that's interesting to hear from you right like because uh, you really believe that because that's I made that question if you say anything different what is approval just said about right and uh, it's just hard because when you leave in Vancouver those ones from Vancouver you understand what I'm saying just to believe you're going to keep the way you are for the next 10 years. But as I said to you, at the same time, it's not hard to believe. If you get outside and look around, you see cranes everywhere. Yeah. Constructions everywhere. And it was like that for the last 14, 15 years. Yeah. I don't know how it was before. I wasn't here. But since I arrived here, it's been like that. Yeah. I, I'll tell you a quick story. I know a property downtown um, actually a property we purchased um, and it went up about $2 million dollars in about three years in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of COVID. Uh, and I thought that during that time, you know, property that the prices might soften, uh, that, that the prices would come down. But no, prices continued to go up. I didn't see any real correction in the market, even during the pandemic. So that is likely some of the toughest times we will ever see in our life. And the real estate in Vancouver continue to, the price continues to go up. You know, how was for your, your pubs? It was tough. It, it was tough for our pubs. It was very tough, um, especially when we were closed. But I must say the Canadian <coughs> government done an amazing job, a spectacular job, job because, uh, They did put the right support in place, but I must also say that um, to apply uh, for some of those uh, support packages, um, it was quite complicated. And I feel sorry for uh, people who didn't have, I guess, the right tools uh, or the right support or, you know, the right bookkeepers or, or, or staff to help them to get um, those subsidies, uh, I feel sorry for them because I know uh, about 200 small businesses in Vancouver alone went, went out of business during COVID. Yeah. We were lucky we had, you know, a finance team in place and we could ask, sit down with them and, and figure out and navigate through the process and, uh, and get those subsidies and, and take advantage of what was available. But a lot of people couldn't and that's very sad. Yeah, we're very lucky here, the Canadian. We have also very strict restrictions, right, for a long time. But on the other hand, the government really gave a lot of help. But that is true what you said. Uh, I have been through the same scenario situation. One thing also, for the moment they're releasing, they're releasing the news about the, 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 the help to take place so you can apply, wait for the moment so you can have access, was the, the, the timeline was quite big. Right. For the moment they release the new to get out the process done, you know, and you apply to get access was take a long time. And when you have your business closed, you know, a long time has <laughs> it's been longer, right? Yeah. It was a tough time and man, I had a, a fire in one of my my schools and my biggest schools. I have a fire in the middle of the pandemic. In the middle of the pandemic, a fire destroy everything. And uh, it was a tough time. It was a really tough time. And what's nice about the, the 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 industry we are in is because you create that connection with the the, the members and the, most of them they cap their membership, you know, and and uh, that's what allowed us to survive because it was a really tough time. Yeah, not miss at all. Yeah, not miss at all. What do a big learning from that? From that, because uh, we have to invent um, ourselves. Yeah, I think my the the biggest lesson was you know. Uh, Tough times don't last, but tough people do. Yeah. You know, we can get through. If we can get through that, we can get through anything. And don't uh, don't get sucked into the, the media. You know, uh, bad stories and press and media, that's what sells. You know, and uh, it's the end of the world and, yeah. and you know, uh, crazy stuff like this. Um, and 
you don't want to get sucked into that. That's what I, I found. And I, you know, stopped listening to the news and I tried to be as positive as I could and, and keep a brave face on. And you just um, got up every day and done the best that you can. And thankfully, uh, one day we got up and it was all over. Yeah, uh, like now, we're going through a hard time now in, economy, uh, in our economy, right? In the world, uh, with the, the, the Ukraine war, with the, this new war now in, in Israel. And I was I was open, get ready to open a, a new business. And some people ask, some questions like, oh, do you think it's time to, to wait to see what's going to happen? I say, I know what's going to happen. So what's going to happen? I'm going to open my business. That's what's going to happen. Right? Yeah. Because... <laughs> Why are you gonna wait? That's right. No, this, is, this is no best moment, you know. Maybe, maybe economically we are here, but eventually we're gonna go up. That's right. Know? And and it's nice to see. I think people like you, will they need to speak more about that because, as you said, what we see in the media, what they put out there, is something totally different. You know, yeah. it's putting too much fear to people. You know, and the people need to get out of that, out of the fear face. It's not gonna be easy. It's not going to be easy either way. If it's a good time or a hard time, it's not going to be easy. So That's better right. get it started. Yeah. We opened up um, four uh, new businesses um, in the middle of COVID. And, you know, <laughs> some people said to me, you're crazy. You're buying pubs and renovating them. And, um, you know, you could be closed down. And uh, those were opportunities that I believe we wouldn't have been able to um, acquire if COVID hadn't happened. Correct. So every yeah. cloud has a silver lining. Yeah. You know? I want to talk to you about <clears throat> about your employees, right? Uh, because it doesn't matter how good leader you are. You know, if you don't know how to pass that on, you know, and don't know how to get the right people around you, you're not going to go far, right? So how you hire your people. You have a process. You like to interview. You like to call. For a referral, what what do you do, and how you recognize someone that this is a good asset to my call? I I married somebody with a HR background. Oh, that helps. <laughs> that helps really. And so you call Lauren. <laughs> Can you interview this guy here, please? Um, uh, no, I'm very lucky that uh, Laura um, is a HR and, and business specialist, so she takes care of a lot of that. But I have done lots, hundreds and hundreds of of interviews myself, and I'll speak to what I do. Um, yeah. I think attitude is everything, absolutely everything. You know, they say, we, we say uh, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work doesn't hard. Work. Yeah. So uh, I always hire for, yes, the right fit. And then you can train people to have the right skills. But uh, what's your right fit then? And uh, I'm pretty good at this point at reading people. And I'll know um, after probably 10 or 15 minutes, I'll have a good a good idea of uh, what that person is like. And um, we have been pretty successful uh, using that process. That process. Uh, yeah. And uh, then I think after that, how do you retain them? A lot of people come to us and say, how do you retain your people? Like we have uh, people who have been with us since the beginning and lots of people who have been with us for five years. And um, I think it's just the the younger generations, I don't think a lot of them are in it for the money. They want to do something that makes them happy and they want to be respected and they want to have a purpose, a real purpose. So, you know, giving them a bit of respect. If you give respect, you'll get respect. I truly believe, believe that. Um, and uh, just lead by example, you know, uh, open communication, um, stuff like that. Get them involved. You know, uh, don't... Uh, have them sitting in the meeting, you know, in the corner, not uh, playing any part at all in the meeting and just sitting there for no reason because you're just wasting their time. So uh, try and encourage them to give feedback and, and to, you know, give us ideas. And, and I always ask, you know, not, uh, you, don't, you don't have to bring um, ideas of what you think we should do. Also bring ideas of what you think we shouldn't do. What you'd like us to stop doing? What's a waste of time? At one point, we set up a moving company, and uh, it was making a bit of money. But it was moving a, company, yeah, a moving company, and it was making a bit of money. And uh, but it was a lot of work, and a lot of work in particular uh, at the weekends. Yes. And our construction uh, teams would work on Saturdays when needed, but they want Sunday off, and 
uh, the moving teams would be kind of connected with the construction because you'd have a lot of the same people helping with different projects. And I asked one day at uh, one of our weekly committee meetings, I said, you know, is anybody else not enjoying this? And uh, like everybody said, yeah, well, I'm not, and I'm not, and I'm not. And, and I said, because I'm not. I said, why don't we just stop doing it? So let's wrap it up by the end of the year. And we did. Because again, I say, life is short. You know, if you want something to be successful, it has to be fun. You have to enjoy it. You have to give it 110%. So we weren't enjoying it. So it was never going to be fun. And we were never going to give it 110%. So we just stopped doing it. And That's very interesting point or, or William because many many people out there when talking about business talking about the you gotta push you know you have to make it happen push and then you come with this breathing insight you know and to ask your people say are you enjoying this no no so let's stop yeah we can't force them to do something they don't like to do you know so uh, we stopped doing it and everybody was happy and like it was like you just took a weight off people's shoulders They didn't want to be doing that anymore. It's like the 80-20 principle, you know. Yeah. You make you make 80% of your profit or your revenue out of 20% of the things you do. So figure out what that 20% is yes. and focus on that. You know, the things you're enjoying, the things that are working. Uh, and the other stuff, clean up, clean that up and try and uh, um, tighten up, I suppose, and uh, not be wasting your time doing things that may be irrelevant. See, so you at home, stop watching those TikToks talk about business. <laughs> people that build anything and start to listen to people like William, right? That's one of the reasons, William, we create this podcast, you know, to because I'm, I'm coming from the sport, right? And I have my business as well, and I love these people, right? So why not? Why create a podcast? I don't want to talk about jiu-jitsu or sports or fight, you know? I want to create, talk about sports because I really like, but also business and That's exactly what the reason we create the X3 podcast. You know, look at the great insight you gave. You know, it's a good lesson to all of uh, everyone of that. It's for myself as well. You know, sometimes you are pushing, and I really believe about the mission. You know, uh, our, our business have a mission, and I really have to. I like to pass that mission to our employees, and when they understand the mission and they see what you see, this is a wonderful job, a wonderful work to do. Okay, so let's jump to. To your family, right? Because we, I can tell you, are very family orientated, right? And for us, when we have multiple business, you know, and many things going on, and you have to take a lot of decisions all the time, right? It's, it's hard to create a balance, you know, between family and, and, and business. And it's hard to understand as well where you have to stop one to start another one, right? To, to do that like a I'm done now, this is my time to my family. Not a lot of people can do that, right? And I want to hear from you. What are you doing to, to balance out your life and your business? I I think experience, um, life experience, uh, taught me a lot. And when I was younger, uh, and not too long ago at all, um, I wouldn't go home unless my emails were at zero. And I would work every hour of every day. Uh, thankfully, after... Um, setting up multiple businesses and learning from some incredible mentors and uh, I guess educating myself by reading books and, and uh, learning about business. Uh, I have met, I have, I guess, uh, managed to deal with that in a different way now. So um, I can, yes, I can close up the laptop and I can go home and I can, I can switch off. Um, but at times, you know, I need to work late. Uh, there's no doubt about that if I have to meet deadlines and, and my wife uh, thankfully understands that. But uh, I understand how important it is to spend time with my family. Um, our three little boys are uh, only going to be this age for a very small time. And, you know, soon they'll be grown up and they'll be gone away uh, like like we did. And um, I can't turn back that time. I'll never get that time back again. So I don't ever want to regret not spending enough time with them. Uh, so I think that that's the most important thing in my life is spending time with my family. Uh, however, I have to make sure that I uh, focus on my business as well and uh, make sure that our companies continue to grow because I believe if you're not growing, you're dying. Uh, there's no in between. So uh, it's just finding that balance. 
Um, but family first, for sure, Rodrigo. Um, that's always been the case for me, and that'll never change. And as you can notice, right, the 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 the, the fast flow of accent here, right? He has an Irish accent, I have a Brazilian accent, and I know you have a Brazilian in your life, and it's actually is very important as well. Talk about her. That's right. Yeah. So Vicky, uh, Virginia, is um, our nanny, and she's been with us since our first son was born uh, six years ago. And she is like a grandmother to the kids, and I cannot say enough uh, good things about her. She never lets us down. Uh, she comes on vacation with us. We've brought her to Ireland. We've been to Mexico together. She's part of the family. Um, and we just couldn't have done it without her. Um, I think the Brazilian people are very much like the Irish people, actually. And uh, we have a lot of the same values and cultures. And uh, Vicky is an absolute sweetheart. And she loves the kids like they're her own. And I have often heard back from people who have seen her at the playground that she doesn't know uh, uh, have seen her. And they know that there are kids. And they'll be like, you know, who's that lady with the kids? She treats them so good and she minds them and, and they love her. And look, at you can't pull the wool over the kids' eyes. You know, they let you know uh, whether whether uh, they're enjoying um, their nanny or not. But uh, they love her as much as she loves them. And uh, we're just truly blessed and grateful to have her in our lives. We have also, uh, our nanny is Brazilian as well. And man, it's so great when I have someone who, really care for your kids, right? Make we you know she goes out with the kid. We're really because they are eyes on at the time. Just so lovely. And Marley, their name as well. We have our nanny Brazilian man. I we just love her, man. Yeah. yeah. We just we just sponsor her to and uh to now she decides she wanna stay here for good and we're so happy about that. Because uh -huh. we are talking about also in the background, talk about the Brazilian culture. And Probably seven percent of the, my employees are Brazilian, and I really like to, to, to hire Brazilian. And they have a reason for that because Brazilian, or oh, they're really good, they're really bad. They have nothing in the mirror as it was explained to you. And if you get a bad Brazilian to work, fire because not gonna get bad better. But also if you get a good one, you know, keep it because it's very hard. It's gonna you know they're gonna drop the ball. Uh, and and how's the Irish? How's the your um, Your I, people. I, I, was, I think uh, the Irish, I, I, I speak to the, yeah, and about 70%, I think, oh, really? of our people are Irish too. We have great experiences um, with hiring the Irish. Uh, look, at, we will hire anybody that comes through our door with the right attitude, that's willing to work hard and learn. Uh, and, um, you know, it doesn't matter where they're from. It doesn't matter at all. And I mean that. But, uh I think just with the IRL and the Irish pubs and us being Irish, you know, Irish owned and operated uh, group, um, it attracts a lot of Irish uh, to our door. And um, we do hire a lot of them. But you're, you're so smart, William. Listen, you have a construction company and a pub, okay? The Irish are well known <laughs> for working hard and drinking beer. So you you build your <laughs> <laughs> your, business, your business around the strength of on the strength of your people. <laughs> Don't be giving away the secret, Rodrigo. Uh, but should have started investing faster than in the soccer schools. So. <laughs> but um, uh, we have people from all over the world. Uh, yeah, there's lots of locals that work with us and. Uh, People from Colombia, um, lots of English, uh, New Zealand, uh, so Kiwis, uh, Australian. It, as I said, it doesn't matter where they come. They come from Poland, Italy. Um, anyone that has the right attitude and is willing to to learn and to work hard uh, is welcome and uh, will be hired uh, at IRL. Every time when I start a new business, I just started in a new field and. I when the our strategy, everything put on the on the paper, with it. and I always like to. As I said, I, the the most part I like the business is not the money, but is to to hire people, you know, and to see that grow. Okay, that's eventually going to bring you money, right? When you hire good people and train them, you see their growing, you know, and pushing and take it over. Uh, that's for us business owner. That's great. Cause then allows us to step a little bit off, right? And I really like to see that. I would like to help people. I would like to see people growing. And I would like to give that opportunity for that. That's what drives me inside the business. 
what is your drive? That's right. Because it's normal money. That's you right. You pass that. You, yeah, that's right. Your people are your company, number one. Uh, and I constantly hear about from uh, uh, our customers, our guests, uh, our clients, I constantly hear uh, about how good our people are. And you're only as strong as your weakest link, you know. So I say to our teams during our staff meetings, if there's somebody that's struggling, you know, we have to focus on that person. We have to help them. We have to bring them up to our level. We have to, because you are only as strong as that person. So um, we do that. And that's our mentality, um, because uh, our people are our strength. And that's why we have done so well. And that's, I credit all of our success to the wonderful people that we have. As I said, they're honest, they're reliable, uh, they're loyal to us, um, they're responsible. You know, we always say, take absolute responsibility. We don't point fingers at anybody, no matter what happens. We do not do that. Nothing good comes from that. Yeah. We take full responsibility. If something happens, we just move on. We fix it as quick as we can and we learn from that. You know, there's no point in harping on about it. Uh, there's no point in playing the blame game. It doesn't make things any better, but it does make them worse. So um, we responsibility is a huge one for us as well. And when people uh, see that uh, coming from the top, from the top down, they they like that. You know, that we're not saying uh, that fish and chips wasn't good because of that person. You know, let's get rid of them. They're fired. We don't do that. No. So we say, what can we do to make sure that that doesn't happen again? Um, and, and, and that... That works. That's great. Uh, another great insight from you, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not criticized, but every time when someone comes to us for, for advice, I just say, just whatever we do right now, you know, try to listen less people on the internet and try to look for books or people who have already been successful. You know, I, I really believe the real knowledge is there because nowadays we, we see any person, most of the person who talk about business online, they relate that with money. You know, and of course, you want to open a business, you want to be successful, and you want to make money. But very soon, as soon as you get the money, very soon, they go change. Yeah. You know, because then you learn you know, when you put it focus on people, that's when they start, the money starts coming even more. That's right. The more you put your focus on the people who are with you and you have to understand that you need people around you, you know, the money will come. You yeah. Know? And you just described that perfectly. And not even that, about the accountability of the business owner. You know, everything happened in business is your fault, you know. And I take the same way, you know, and try to see it doesn't matter. If a guy at the end that just hired, you know, if made a mistake there, it's first my mistake. I hire that person. I have to go all the way down to see what is the problem is to try to fix. And a lot of people doesn't do that. You know, yeah. A lot of pointing fingers, you know. When I look at it, or William, about the, the the role of the business owner nowadays, you know, they change a lot. You know, when I talk with people who's been in business for 40, 50, 60 years, you know, of course the internet came to change the game, you know. But we need to take what you said, take the accountability, you know, and say, it's on us. It's not because you're the boss, you know, you're going to point a finger to others and try to, it's pretty easy for you, right? Yeah, so it's your fault. No, it's yeah. your fault. You're fired. No, I solved the problem. I fired. Let's hire another one. Yeah, and I see that happening all the time. All the time. Yeah, all and, the time. And when it happens, it creates nothing but anxiety. Everybody else in the office, they're thinking, "Am I next? Who's going to get the blame next? Who's going to be fired next?" Uh, and the same company owners have come to me and asked me, "How do you retain your people?" And what do you do for retention? And they think, well, if we give them big bonuses, that'll help. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, culture is everything. And, you know, you have to create the right culture. And you can't just, it's not just writing it down or putting it up on the walls in your boardroom or in your hallway. That doesn't work. You know, you have to walk the walk as well. That's great. William, well, the, the acts in our uh, podcast is not for... It's not because we've been sponsored by Elon Musk, right? It's not about that. Uh, it's about the destination, right? And we are ways of talking about that. When you're looking forward, where's my destination? Where do I want to be? You know, in my business, in my personal life, you know? So where's your destination? You know, like as a successful man like you, it, it, it's nice to hear from you. 
what do you see yourself in 10 years from now on your business and your personal life? Well, uh, yeah, success to me is um, raising my family and for my kids to want to spend time with their dad and their mom and That's to go important. on and yeah, and to go on, uh, you know, family vacations together and to enjoy that, to enjoy spending time with us. Um, I think that that's success to me in my personal life. Um, to be happy and to be healthy, I always say. Those are the most important things. Uh, for business, I do have uh, big goals and ambitions. Uh, my, my, I guess my long-term goal is to own a billion dollars in real estate. So uh, I'll keep going until I... Uh, and you're going to start tonight, right? Like, yes. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. We're right in the beginning of it. <laughs> <laughs> we're in 10 years, we're now going to bring you back because Barry have a billion dollars in investment, man. <laughs> so um, uh, when I say that to some people, you know, they, la they laugh. And I like that because I think if your goals are not big enough, and if, if they're not big enough, people won't laugh at them. And then you have to, you have to reach for the moon and end up in the stars. You know, you have to have big goals. Um, when I look back at where I was 10 years ago, if somebody told me I'd be here where I am today, mm. everybody would have been laughing. Yeah. You know, so um, I think dream big uh, and then do just do the best that you can. Get up every day and do the best that you can. Uh, be a good person. It's it's as simple as that. Um, keep positive. Surround yourself with the right people as well. Uh, get mentors, you know. Um, That's important, right, William? It, it's very important. Yeah. Surround yourself with positive people and people that have the right mindset. Uh, and as you said, people who have already ac achieved the success, you know, that you want to achieve, you know, they've been there, they've done that. We're not trying to recreate the wheel here. It's been done a million times before. Just uh, try and find those people who will help you. Uh, and they're out there. There's so many people who are happy to help. Uh, we have an advisory board of some amazing people they're so successful I can't believe that they said yes when I asked them to be on our advisory board and they were honoured and they told me that they were honoured uh, and that they were looking forward to learn from me and I, I couldn't believe that you know so that's the mentality they have they're like William not alone are you going to learn from us and these some of these guys are the most successful people I know and and girls and they say you know we're looking forward to learning from you and, you know, just stuff like that. So um, I think that's important. You know, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Uh, I always say that, and it's so true. So I, th that's how my structure works. Right? I have three people very close to me, and uh, every time I need kindness, and I call one of them, depends on the kind of kindness. Right? If one more towards life, no, this is one person. It's more towards business, another person, right? And another one more towards money is another person. And I'm so lucky because three of them, they are very successful in each field, you know, and just have those people I can call. They're going to pick up my, my call. Yeah. It's huge advantage for me. Yeah. You know. That's right. Uh, business, you know, you're talking about the different industries. Business is the same no matter what you do. Yeah. It's the same, you know, if you break it down. So I think the two important things are trust and relationship, you know, relationships and trust. And again, that just goes back to people, you know. So uh, networking is very important, I find, here in North America, like putting yourself out there, uh, getting to know the right people and then building the relationship so you can, you can have that trust. And when you do need help, if you ever do need help, and, you know, those days do come, those people are there to support you, you know, because it can be, it can be lonely at the top. Um, yeah. And, and uh, sometimes we get uh, caught up in that and we forget about uh, uh, everything else and it becomes very lonely and um, we go down the wrong rabbit holes. So you got to be careful and you got to surround yourself with like-minded people. I think uh, I, I'm a member of uh certain CEO groups that meet maybe five, six times a year. And, and once a year, we'll go away on vacation together. And everybody on that trip, they're all CEOs and successful people. And it's nice to spend three or four days with them, whether it's in Palm Springs or uh, in Victoria. Um, and, and these are all like-minded people who have the same problems as each other. And we're just there to help each other and support each other. And everybody talks about uh, whatever they need support with you know, for those few days and we all help each other out. And it's, it's been a huge benefit 
uh, to me in my life. William, let me ask you something. And I, I thought about myself where I just came for a, a lunch with a friend of mine and he was looking for a job. And uh, I said, hey, how was your last interview? And he was describing and he said, what happened? Why didn't you get a job? So the guy asked how much I, I, I want to make it. And when I told him, I think it was a little bit above what it was, what he was expecting. And right away in my mind, I said, why well, don't say you want to work for free? You're not working anyways. Why well, you said you're not going to work for free for a week or two just to show what you can do it. Because maybe he's basing your value what you're saying, what he's saying to people, but he didn't see you work. I didn't tell him that because he didn't ask me. But that was the process in my mind right away. So today, if I lose everything, they just leave my wife and my kids. Okay. And I have to tomorrow morning restart again. Of course, going to start with a smile in my face. And the first thing I do is to decide which kind of field that I want to put myself in. It's not to take what is available. I will decide which field I want to put myself in. And that's exactly what I to do. I first study the field, and today we have this knowledge available for everyone. Like, you're my age. 20 years ago, if you want information, you should go to, go to the library. Look for a book, right? You remember? Yeah. Now it's so easy. Yeah. So I would study everything about that industry, and I would get to a store. <laughs> Talk if they want to put myself to work for free, you know, to show what I have to, what I can do. That would be my strategy because I, as a business owner, if someone walks in my business and say, I want to work for free for a month. I just want to, allows me to show what I'm capable to do. That's something to take my attention right away. I will not be comfortable to let someone work for free, but I definitely will wait for one or two weeks to see, you know, that would be my strategy. What would be your strategy in the same situation, William? I think that's um, very similar uh, to what I would do. And uh, I know if somebody proposed that to me, um, yes, I would put them to the test. I would say, okay, let's see what they're made of. And I'd keep them going for maybe not the four weeks, maybe it's two weeks. But I would pay them for every hour that they have worked. But I would really appreciate the fact that they were putting their neck on the line to prove themselves and willing to work for free. And that attitude uh, speaks for itself. And them are the kind of people um, I like to surround myself with. Um, so I think that's a very good strategy and it's probably something very similar to, to what I would do. Um, uh, you know, got a problem, right? We know, me and you got a problem. Yeah. As soon as the show goes off, goes live, next day they have a line of people in front of my visa to your business. <laughs> <laughs> But I think yeah, something like that. Yeah. You know, saying to, to somebody, um, you know, give me the opportunity. Let me work for a few days at least. Thank you. Um, and if you're not happy with my work, and if you don't think I'm up to scratch or that I'm the right fit, um, then feel free to let me go. You know, and I'll shake your hand and I'll walk away. I think that's uh, a very good strategy, and that's something that I would likely propose myself. Can you imagine one guy comes today, do that proposal for you, that offer for you, take it. This guy's walking your your pub in Granville, and then he starts working for free. They all staff know he's getting the job. He said you're going to work for free, and the, everyone's watching that guy. He's not making money. The first to arrive, the last one to leave, watching everything, doing everything perfectly, helping. That will bring the game up on the staff as well. Yeah. They say, man, these guys are trapped. We need to bring yeah. our game up. Yeah. So I really like that strategy. This is a good advice for you at home, okay? If you look for a job, <laughs> you know, that's what we do. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely, that's what we do. Well, that's what, that's what uh, business owners look for in their teams, you know. Um, I always say the good habits. <clears throat> I, I ask our, in, in particular, our management to have a daily good habits list. Uh, stuff like just start at the beginning of the day, get up early, you know, uh, good hygiene, um, exercise. Uh, it's proven that the two most important things for anxiety, mental health, are um, socializing and exercising. Those two things. So um, networking, putting yourself out there, uh, going to the gym, um, you know, When you go to the gym, you're going to see people, you're going to exercise. So those things are very important. Um, eating healthy, you know, so another thing. So I have a list, my, my seven daily good habits, and I practice 
those things every day and they work for me and uh, they have changed my life and I encourage our teams to do the same and uh, it works for them too but everybody is different yeah. you know so that's why I don't say this is the list and you got to do this I say create your own daily good habit list and um, just some very simple things you can start with three you can start with five you can start with ten but try and be consistent try and do these things every day uh, a bit of exercise um, eat healthy uh, fasting is something that works really well for me I do a lot of intermittent fasting I did so, one last week for three days 72 yeah. hours so yes yeah, so once a month how really? about you well so I do it uh, daily so I will um, eat my dinner when I go home from work and then I won't eat the next day till noon yeah so I'll fast I don't have I don't do breakfast for 80 years as well yeah. so I, I do my daily fasting I don't do breakfast I I have my lunch around one, two. Sometimes I have dinner, sometimes I don't. Just eat the fruit, or sometimes I don't eat at all. Just have one meal. Because that's how I got used to. Yeah. Kind of. Depends. Like, last night I was out for a dinner with a friend. Of course, I ate something, right? Yeah. But if I'm at home, if at night, if I have my lunch, one, two, I don't eat dinner, and I go all the way to the lunch next day. But I adapt myself to that. I don't, that's not any advice of diet, anything like that. Is that something I do? But once a month... I do a bigger length, like a 48 or 32 hours, right? right? So once a month. So that's what I do every day. No breakfast, just lunch and sometimes dinner or fruit or something very light or nothing. And once a month. But in December, I want to do one week, but it's going to be only fruit. So I'm going to pick two or three fruits and see how it goes. I never did it one week. One week. Wow. So I wanna, I'm not going to do fasting. It's going to be With based fruit. on fruits and see how it goes. If yeah. in the fourth day I'm not feeling well, I stop it. Right, so but I'm very into that as yeah. well to, yeah. to get to know more my body and understand how things work. That's right, and everybody is different, you know. Yep. So I say you can't push anything on on anyone because I have friends that I worked with uh, carpenters as well on construction sites, and they can't leave the house until they have their breakfast. They just cannot yep. function unless they eat a breakfast. I am the opposite. I'm like you. If I had a big breakfast, you know, I'd be sluggish. I am better when I fast for the first half of the day and I eat in the afternoon. That's great. I love this podcast. Uh, that's that's what we're about. That's the X3 is about. And uh was a pleasure, oh, William, to, to have you here. I'm, 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 I really want to interview your wife as well because I bet I'm going to get a lot of good insight from her. She'd love that. The, yeah, I definitely want to have an, her in the show. And let me know as well if you want to allow her in the show or not. If she can come with Vicky as well, so I can interview Vicky. <laughs> uh, that would be great. Have both of them on the show. That would be so, so cool. this is send a big hug to Laura and Vicky. I will. And tell them they are invited. Just let them us know when they can come. And uh, man, thank you to take your time. No, I don't... I, 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 I don't know if you, you can understand how valuable it is to have you, a person like you, with your success, with your story. You know, we started 14 years ago, come for the Canada, you know, we start everything from scratch and build what you build in 14 years ago and come to the show and give it that for free. You know, and the majority of the good knowledge out there is out there for free, but some people, they are not prepared. I don't know why they, they can't take and absorb and put it to work. And thank you for, for, Donate your time. You know, and You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me onto your podcast. And I'm not going to forget. So we put it your ex in 10 years. So a billion dollars investment in real estate. So I'm going to call you in 10 years from now. Okay. <laughs> Please do it. <laughs> I hope you love this show as much I did. You know, and we got a lot of insights, you know, a lot of good ideas, a lot of information. Take notes and let us know in the comments. That's very important to let us know. And also, so we can improve the show for you. The show is made for you. X3 is your destination for business, sport, and people. And we did talk about the three subjects today, even a little bit more. We talk about at the end about the fasting as well. And yeah, let us know in the comments what you, you thought, your questions, and so we can improve the show for you. Okay, so thank you very much. And don't forget to subscribe in our social media, follow us, and give us some ideas as well who you want to see on the show next. Okay, have a good one. Bye-bye, William. Thank you very much one more time. You're very welcome. Thank you too. Bye.